thank you so much for coming to my defense first thing in the morning on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you especially to Cameron and Avi for being on our committee. Uh, so I'm sure you all have better things to do. I'm going to cut to the chase. I'll start by saying just a few words about the title. So, um, <laughs> Black Hole Physics has really become an experimental physics now. All right, so thanks to LIGO, we even have gravitational wave as a new tool for us to study these unseeable objects. However, the majority of our methods still rely on electromagnetic emission to move into the black hole. So that explains the observation part. Now, in the past few decades, we've obtained an enormous amount of data telling us that black holes, especially supermassive ones in active galactic nuclei, in fact, spin extremely fast. So that explains the high spin part. Now, these fast spinning black holes are actually extremely interesting, theoretically. So it's been all my PhD to, to use analytical methods to do all sorts of computations regarding astronomical phenomena, phenomena that happen near the, in the region near black holes. Okay, so I can't really start talking without thanking a few people. Thank you so much, Andy. You're such an inspirational physicist, full of ideas, and you're just the nicest person ever. It's hard to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I feel extremely lucky to be a student. Now, here are four beautiful, smart, intelligent people my collaborators, <laughs> Achilles, Alex, Dan, and Delayla. So, thank you guys for working with me the past few years and teaching me so much. And I want to say thank you, especially to Achilles and Alex, who have almost been my secondary advisors. Thank you. And uh, I want to say a special thank you to Jacob and Lisa, who brought all, uh, all us Harvard Physics students. And uh, to uh, say thank you to my friends and colleagues here. Some of them have code names, like AQ, <laughs> 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 And I'm a code name, Joanna, Lisa, and others. <laughs> and outside of physics, I'm really thankful to my forum at Harvard Graduate Student Leadership Institute, who uh, gave me a lot of moral support, as well as my writer friends, who um, feel the other part of my life is joy, and Margaret, who gave me home, and others. And many thanks to DJ Osman, as you know him here, for, um, for his constant support. And finally, my, friend, uh, my parents, they're down under across the Pacific Ocean, but I do owe them for everything. Okay, so my thesis is based on the following papers. I'm going to be devoting about equal time on each of them throughout my talk. The first one was written with Achilles and Andy, second with Alex and Achilles, and third one with Delilah, then Alex and Andy. So here's a <laughs> Yeah, I hope you don't mind how it is. <laughs> okay, so I'll start by telling you a little bit about the theory of floating black holes. And in particular, I'll be focusing on the region near the horizon of a fast spinning black hole. Then I'm going to present to you a method to solve photon geodesics analytically. So these are the geodesics that connect the emitting region, which is near the black hole, and the observing region, which is us. Okay, and then I'll uh, say a few words about observation, which is an important reason why it is um, our own research, theoretical research, is important and will lead to the later part of my talk. Firstly, um, the accretion disk flux. So I'll, I'll be showing you a method to compute analytically the flux due to the emission in well, the portion of an accretion disk that's near the horizon of a black hole. Okay. And finally, I'll be presenting uh, a method to find the polarization, the reason why I use the word well will become later, uh, clear later, to find the polarization from a black hole in the center of the galaxy M87. And finally, I'll conclude. So everything will be done analytically. So I'm using just one slide to bring everyone to the same page. Curved black holes are characterized by their mass and their spin. So in particular, you can think of the effect of mass of a black hole on space-time, like the boy or the tiger on the top column. And you can think of the spin of a black hole effect on space-time like either embedded. So think of space-time as topology, and now it dips, and think of space-time as the um, better, and now it twists. Okay, so that's the story. Now, there are four... Wait, so wait, I what yeah. was the tiger doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's just dipping the topology. This is the... Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two pictures. solutions to Einstein field equations. The uncharged, non-spinning Schwarzschild case, which has spherical symmetry, 
the uncharged, uh, the uncharged staining case, which is not resin nostrum. The uncharged, uh, sorry, the uncharged staining core case. <laughs> the charged non-staining resin nostrum case. And finally, the charged staining core lumen case. Now, uh, what we are interested in astronomically is really core black hole. It's because any black hole that has electromagn uh, electric charge, it will get neutralized easily in the, our big universe. So we want to focus on core black hole. Now, the core metric, first written down by Roy Kerr in 1963, describes a neutral rotating black hole of mass m and angular momentum j equal to am. A is the spin parameter that I'll be using a lot later. So in boyle Lindquist coordinates, it's given by this form here. Uh, so here I'm using headed coordinates for Kerr, and throughout my talk, I'll be using unheaded coordinates for something later, which is C so. And phi is the azimuth angle, theta is the polar angle, as usual. And one thing you can quickly see is if you set A equal to zero, you'll quickly get back the Schwartz Schwartz solution. So curved black holes have two symmetries, FC symmetry around the X, uh, axis of rotation, as well as time translation symmetry. Okay, so this brings me to that in curved space time, any uh, time-like or uh, any, any geodesic, whether it's photon or massive particles, it will have three conserved quantities. The conserved energy, the conserved angular momentum, and the Carter constant, which was not derived through geometric consideration. But if you take the Newtonian limit of the photon pole, you'll get back the square of um, angular momentum in the equatorial plane. Okay. So now, maximally spinning black hole, black holes are spinning extremely fast, they have satisfied the bound of um, A equal to M. So A is our spin parameter there. So if you exceed the bound, then you get like a singularity, and that's not allowed. And M is the location of the event horizon. So this is um, for this maximally spinning black hole, we call them extreme or extremal curved black holes. So uh, the curve, the curve metric is great for describing space-time with a rotating black hole in it. But if we want to study the near horizon region of a fast spinning black hole, it turns out there is a better choice. Let me first introduce the dimensionless Barton Horowitz co coordinates. So right now I've just done coordinate transformation, that's all. But what's called the near horizon extreme curve or MAC region is given by R much, much less than one, that region. So if you look back at my coordinate transformation, look at the last one, when R is much less than one, R hat is supposed to be extremely close to M, the location of the horizon. So that's when we zoom onto that region and study. Okay, so MAC has a metric. As you can see, it's quite much simpler than the curved version. And MAC metric uh, resolves the MAC region and it also solves Einstein field equation. One thing you can realize pretty easily is that if you take R to say lambda R and T to T over lambda, then that leaves the metric invariant. You can do that as many times as you want. And I'm using unhappy coordinates for MAC from now on, okay? So this brings me to the fact the MAC geometry has an enhanced SL2R plus U1 isometry. It's generated by the following <coughs> vector fields. In particular, you can see that the uh, axis symmetry and time translation symmetry are just inherited from Kerr, but the time translation symmetry is in fact enlarged to an SL2R. And that also includes dilation symmetry, which I just described to you before, as well as um, the special conformal transformation. Okay, so this is me and Kanye pondering over neck. So <laughs> for the rest of my talk, please keep the word neck in mind. <laughs> okay, so I started by telling you how we can solve photon geodesics analytically. Now, five years after um, Kerr wrote down his metric, Kerr wrote down his integral equations of motion for the geodesics by using the Hamilton Jacobi method. I apologize for showing you complicated equations, but what I did here is to just, I took Carter's equation and then I rewrote them in MAC coordinates. So it's just a coordinate transformation. But uh, here the self squared M indicates the near region, which is the MAC region within near the black hole, and indicates the far region where our telescope <coughs> and your name are at. So this, um, the capital R of R, capital theta of theta, capital phi of R, capital T of R, are complicated functions that I'm not writing out. So as you can probably imagine, this cannot be integrated analytically. 
usually what people do is to use numerics. They write this in terms of Jacobi elliptic integral and study that numerically. No one has ever um, done it analytically. But our goal is to do the integration analytically somehow. In order to do that, let me just say a few words about conservativity. So there's actually a relation between the net angular momentum and energy and the current ones for light from, for example, accretion disk, which I'll get to in later part of my talk. So the relation is given by this. The uh, angular momentum, conserved angular momentum are the same. But the net energy E is 2Me minus L, where 2Me is very close to L. And because of that, I can actually define dimensionless parameters. This lambda here, 1 minus L over 2Me, is much, much less than 1, just follows from the fact above. And the Q, uh, which is related to the Carter constant, I'm just redefining for simplicity. That's it. OK. So now the question is, can we exploit net symmetries to resolve the emission point and connect the photon trajectories out to cloud observers? I just described to you on this polymer to see mega. So there's more symmetry. So how do we make use of that? The answer is matched asymptotic expansion. So the mass mathematical method of matched asymptotic expansion is extremely powerful and usually involves uh, finding different solutions depending on the range of the variable that's in question. So in particular, for the case of curve, the natural variable to choose is, of course, r, because when you're close to the black hole, you have small r. When you're far from the black hole, you have large r. I'm going to call the near region r much less than 1, the far region r much greater than the square root of lambda. And finally, there's an overlap region in between. So I'll show you the simplest example, which is the case of the radio integral. This doesn't look too bad. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Overlap Lambda, what is your lambda? lambda? Uh, my lambda is this, a small quantity. Much, much less small. Okay. That's right. So this actually is only that. That's right. Mm -hmm. What was lambda again? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Lambda is, yeah, 1 minus yeah. 2 me. Yeah. Yeah, so although it doesn't look too bad, you cannot do it analytically. If you don't believe me, you can put it in mathematical net. <laughs> <laughs> is much greater than square root of lambda, the last two terms get dropped off. And now, both equations become integrable if you substitute them into the denominator. So you can integrate both of them, and in the end, match the, your results in the matching region in between, where you can fix constant of integration and make sure the leading terms match. This is a leading term method. Uh, yeah, leading, uh, this method is a leading method. So, uh, when you do that, you obtain an integration result, which is quite remarkably simple. It's just given by this form uh, with a log in there. So it's in terms of elementary functions only. There's no Jacobi elliptic integral or anything like that. And I'll show you a picture. On the left here is just the cartoon. We take the near region, the far region, and match them in between. And I actually did some uh, comparison between numerical and analytical results. So they match pretty well, and in fact, Rm is the location of the near region where the photon comes from. So you can see, the closer we are to uh, zero, r equal to zero is the horizon, the better the matching is. And when we are far away, it makes less sense. Okay. So is Rn over lambda? Rn is order lambda, that's right. Yeah. And what about capital Rn? Cap oh, cap that's a function. It's a function of r. But it's order lambda squared. Square. It's order lambda, yeah. Because, um, it's square, it's square root. So R is uh, yeah. so for the near region, uh, what you can do is to drop the first two terms because R becomes too small, right? So you have R squared term here, and when you take the square root, that will just become R. Yeah. So that's why in the denominator is order R. So yeah, so that's what we're doing. And it works pretty well. Now this is a summary for just this little part. That's me right there. And then there's a black hole. And of course, it curves space time in crazy ways. So I just do all the photon geodesic, which is in red. <laughs> and in the middle, we use much asymptotic expansion. <laughs> so what we've done is to take an emitter in that and take an observer who is far. And 
We determine trajectories of light from net to far observers in terms of elementary dimensions <coughs> only. And this lays the groundwork for later parts of my talk. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> what, what do you assume about the emitter? Is it moving or is it free falling? Or? Uh, it follows geodesics. That's, that's all we are assuming. So this is just a mathematical method. Later we'll specialize it to special case of um, equation disks where particles are moving on circular orbits. And then we can use the result. Okay, so I'll just say a few words about observation, which leads to the next part of my talk, and make you, um, we want to make use of our, our analytical method. So, okay, as I said, curved black holes are characterized by mass and spin. How can we measure the mass of a black hole in general? Well, what you can do is to look at the neighboring star of the black hole. And by looking, what I mean is to take a bright star that's, al that's obviously gravitationally affected by something that you cannot see, which is a black hole, so uh, whose light is not obstructed by other kinds of light sources in the universe. That's the first step. And then you can determine that star's orbit, its size, and its period. It takes some time. But then it's very easy. You can just use laws of gravitation, Newton's law, Kepler's law, to determine the mass of the black hole. This is doable for stellar mass black holes in Milky Way. It has been done for a lot of them. And um, we call the um, neighboring star the companion star. But it's very difficult for supermassive black holes. Why? Because supermassive black holes are huge, right? So against this huge black hole, that star is really nothing. Even after 10 years, it has only traveled from here to here against the big black hole. Because of that, it's almost impossible to determine the star's orbit. So it's very difficult. And here is um, a table of black holes classified by mass. They go from stellar mass to intermediate to supermassive. And I just want to point out that Cygnus X1 is actually the first black hole we've observed indirectly in the 70s. And at the time, Stephen Hawking believed that it was not a black hole and he made a bet against Kipler that it was not. But in the end, uh, he's, you can see his defeat. <laughs> <laughs> right, I also want to talk about Sagittarius A star a little bit. That is the black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, its mass has been determined. Uh, it's 1 million, 1 million solar mass. And how people. Oh. Oh, it's four. Okay, yeah, that's more than ninety. Yeah, it's four million um, solar mass. Uh, right, and what I read from the paper is it's really done through a lot of astrophysicists' hard work. They trace a lot of stars near it for twenty-five years continuously, and it's also possible. I think one reason that makes it a little simpler is because it's only twenty-five thousand light years away from the center. <laughs> I don't say only, but compared to out of galaxy. Supermassive black holes that is really pretty close to us. So <laughs> what, what's the radius of it then? The radius is, you said it's huge, right? For the it's watching. Yeah. What is it? You were saying that it's difficult to observe the period of the star. That's right. right. It's but, but the size of this is not that big, is it? What is the size? Uh, the size of these black holes? Yeah. It can, it can be pretty big. It's a million times more than this sun. The sun is a yeah. kilometer or so, right? If it leaves a black hole. Yeah. So it's about the million yeah, times the million times the orbit of the Earth. That's yeah. right. I think the thing is, it's a, for stellar mass, that you, what you're describing here, like, if, if we have anything that's comparable to our sun, that's a stellar mass black hole. But supermassive is just much no, no, much. No, I'm saying the size, you yeah. said it's difficult to, yeah. to follow a nearby star to find the speed and all that. So yeah. it moves a little bit. The size of it is basically, as you just said, it's like 10, it's a million kilometers, right? The yes. radius of these. Well, not 10, 10 million. Yeah. So in that context, it's, it's, I mean, galactically, it's not that huge, I would think. I mean, I, mean, I mean, it doesn't sound it's like tiny. It. It's tiny. So when you say that stuff, we're going to have difficulty seeing this stuff. Why is that so? I mean, the orbit of the star is not that slow. I mean, we're going around the sun. It takes 10 years for a billion no. years. Yeah, it's still, it takes a long time. Oh, 10 years, that's okay. Right. So there is actually a problem <laughs> today, the center of oh, astrophysics, really? exactly on, on observations, and it's a, the innermost star is just 10 years. Uh, that's 10 the years innermost, and some yeah. of them can be more obstructed, I suppose, because, you know, there's absorbers in the Milky Way. And well, there is so dust absorption, like, right? But right. we do see stars moving yeah. the, around, just like you see this thing. Right, but not that easy. Huh? <laughs> I think it works very hard. It's a lot of work. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. 
So how do I measure the spin of a black hole? This is directly relevant to the next part of my talk. Now this is in general a difficult task, but one thing that a lot of astrophysicists tend to do is to take a black hole with an accretion disk. So you might think of an accretion disk as like this calm and cool rings of Saturn, that's not true because it's all very energetic, it's nothing like that. Now, you can examine emission by one particular type of atom in that disk. And astrophysicists usually take iron, uh, whose, uh, it, when they uh, emit a photon, the photon's energy is at 6.4 keV. They're in front of you. But, as we know, there's gravitational redshift and spinning black holes have blue shift as well, like when they start going towards you. So because that, it leads to a whole range of observed values for photons emitted by that atom. So because of that, basically, why the wider the observed energy, the higher the spin. So that's a, a sketch, an easy way for people to determine that. And here, uh, believe it or not, I actually spent a portion of my PhD in plotting real data. So this is data from a black hole called MCG 63015, and we believe that to be spinning at at least 98% of the maximum rate. And it's data from the X-ray telescope Moon Star in 2017. So it's pretty... Um, recent. And the, the situation is, okay, this is observed flux on the y-axis, on the x-axis is the uh, uh, observed energy. Or you can also equivalently write the redshift vector, which is observed energy over emitted energy. Now, it Wait, takes... Where is the rest? Can you point that's right. The rest? This, that's right. Here, right here. Now, if it was Schwarzschild, then what you would expect is to just like peak and come down. It wouldn't have this tail structure, so we call this the broadening of iron line, uh, which is due to the spin of the black hole. Yeah, so this brings me to the accretion disk flux that we're going to compute. So as we know, accretion disks can be really big. They actually can stretch onto a few uh, light hours. Maybe. So it's huge. But we're going to compute the portion of the flux from the portion of the disk that's inside MAC, which we can do analytically. Here's the setup. Here I have a black hole. and. I'm going to surround the black hole with a thin stationary equatorial disk of slowly accreting matter. So by slowly accreting, what I mean is that the particles are going to go on circular orbits. Where I'm going to ignore the radial motion. And uh, so here's the story. You have corona, which we don't know exactly what it is, but it is um, it emits energetic X-rays. So it's an X-ray source. And that X-ray uh, excites iron atoms in that disk, and in turn, the iron atoms emit light, which can be observed by a distant observer. But in general, this is complicated. There's a lot of complication with the analysis. As I've mentioned before, like near the black hole, there's absorption, and near Milky Way, there's also absorption, and there's also intergalactic things, like a lot of compli uh, complications um, that I'm not expert of. And also, of course, you can see the corona directly. It's very bright, so that light also counts as noise. So it's complicated, but what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is to use the method of geometric optics to um, compute the flux. So this is a method built upon what Gordon and Cunningham first came up with in 1973. What you can do is to define these parameters called alpha and beta. So think of alpha as like a coordinate in front of observer screen, as well as beta. So observer is holding up the screen. Now you might remember, lambda is related to the angular momentum of the um, photon coming at you, and q is related to the conserved constant. Now, I'm holding this screen. My alpha is basically the phi component, and my beta is the theta component. Okay, so that's the observer as observer's end of the story. Now there's a redshift factor that I can define, g being the observed energy over the source energy. All my subscripts S stand for the source here, so this is the en energy of the source, US the, is the velocity of the air atom going around, or any atom, <laughs> and RS is the location of the source. Okay. okay, so what do we have? On one end of the story, I have a bright disk that's emitting light. On the other end of the story, I have an observer holding up a screen. So how do I connect them? Well, one way to connect them is to uh, do it through conserved quantities, lambda and Q. Because regardless of which end of the story you're at, the conserved quantities do not change. Now, if you put all pieces of information together, you get an expression for the observed flux. So the Jacobi, Jacobians are as before. The G, uh, G to the fourth, three of the Gs come from the phase space invariance of number of photons. 
And the other G comes from fixing the emitted energy to be at one particular value. So you can make it the iron case or something else. There's yeah. a question. This integral should go only down to the innermost state of circular orbit. That's right, yeah. So our, you didn't trust the expression for that. So how does that relate on lambda over the head? So, so, so you're, you're including that. Yeah, so I... Have to pin the disk. That's right. I fixed my disk to terminate at the innermost stable circular orbit. And in two slides, I'll show you something okay. that show, has that explicitly. Okay. But, right, one other thing I want to mention is the emissivity function. Yeah, it, it won't turn out to be too important, but in general, um, astrophysicists fix it by taking a power law or a broken power law. But in three slides, I'll show you that we can use symmetry arguments to fix that emissivity to be a particular thing. Okay, so the difficulty in computing this really lies on computation of the Jacobian. But the first one can actually be computed quite easily. If you know how to differentiate, then you can compute it. <laughs> on the other hand, though, the second one is traditionally uncomputable. People study this through Jacobian elliptic integrals, and they use a lot of ray tracing methods. But we found for the particular case of emissions coming from that, we found an explicit expression for it. Here, my Q of G is explicitly written out. I just didn't include it because it's long. But we have it, just for neck. And now, if you put all pieces together, then you obtain a universal result given by this form here. Beta is also an explicit function of G, uh, a little long, but it's explicit. And the emissivity, emissivity function that I mentioned before, as you can see, you can integrate uh, this out is just a function of r, so it really overall just contributes a factor to it. That's all. And I have some pictures to show you. On the left here, uh, this is the black hole shadow, which is region behind which light cannot um, reach you. So the stunning fact is that all our computation, so my statement I want to make here is that for the portion of accretion disk that's inside neck, the only place where light can come out on the observer screen is on this red line. That's it. Yeah, so everything is fixed to appear right there. And in fact, we have, um, so this is uh, edge on. And if you have face on, you actually cannot observe it. There's a critical angle at 47, 48 degrees, beyond which you cannot see light from the neck region of an accretion disk. And on the right here, I plot my flux against my redshift factor G. So for three cases, 90 degrees is the equatorial case, and 75, and then 60. So it kind of, kind of makes sense. If you think about it, when G equals to 1, that's when there's no blue shift, no red shift, right? But when we're near the equatorial plane, you can think of my thumb as the black hole's uh, axis of symmetry, then it's, it's going around this way. So anything that comes from this side, <laughs> it's going to show blue shift effects. That's why we have a lot of blue shifts, which is different from what we originally expected. Originally, we thought it would just be a lot of gravitational redshift that's dominating. Yeah, you mentioned also yeah. 47 degrees as a special angle. That's so right. Where does it come from, this 47? Oh, it, it comes from, so in one of my earlier equations, oh, I can't remember what this is. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it comes from here, the theta turning point. Yeah, so when, uh, this is the complicated function, but it, com it fully comes from here because this cannot be negative, right, with whatever is inside the square root. So it's pretty fascinating. There's a narrow window where you can see the particular kind of light that comes from a creation disk. What's, what happens to the geometry of theta equals, of the neck region at theta equals 47 degrees? At theta equal to 47 degrees, uh, let's see. I think when theta equals to 47 degrees, the denominator... No, I mean the curve geometry. What happens to the curve geometry? Um, What's... It's just that the photons cannot escape? Is that what... <laughs> right, so, okay, there's, there's a complicated story. It's not that all photons cannot escape. Some of them can. So this, this, is, this is related to a, a related project on my Alex, Andy, and Sam. But uh, there are two types of geodesics, technically, that's coming out of that. One type, um, so the type I'm dealing with here is accretion disk light. That cannot come out outside that angle. But there's another type, which I'll get to in the next part of my talk, actually, where light does come out in all angles. And that's, for example, you know the um, black hole M87, which is 15 degrees um, off axis from our Milky Way. So that light can be observed, and that light is not constrained to be on that line. The reason why, uh, now it's coming out on this line is because we have a small parameter here, and this is 
what we call the super radiant bound. And without this uh, constraint of the small parameter, without that relation between energy and angular momentum, the light can't come out. Yeah, so it's specific to one part of light. And that's the case, in some sense, like, it's interesting because it's the case preferred by nature. Nature has accretion disks. Okay, so, um, so now I'm going to show you a symmetric model for a disk, which will help us fix the emissivity. So here I'm writing down a particle number current for a disk. So this is conserved and it's given by a row, which is number density per unit um, radial length. The heavy side function fixes R to terminate as it goes, so the um, accretion disk cannot go beyond that. And finally, I have a delta function fixing um, the disk to be on an equal parallel plane. <laughs> And I have the velocity us for particles that are, which are going around it. So if I assume my particles to be emitting um, isotropically, then we might we might refer that to that as star number rather than particle number. Okay, star number. <laughs> that sounds cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, star number just to be sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so if it's you know isotropic, then the emissivity function is proportional to rho. Now, as I told you early on, there's dilation symmetry in that net. That basically tells us there's a uniform particle number density per unit popular radial length. So wherever you are on that, you should have the same number of particles. So in particular, if you, you know, compute the full um, number of particles, then I'm putting in all the components for the induced metric and the, um, the star number current in it, then you see it's proportional to the length of net. So with that explicit uh, expression for emissivity, which we fix, it will tell you that um, this factor basically gives you a law of epsilon, where epsilon measures the deviation from extremality. So you can you might think this is a divergence, but it's really one of the slowest divergences we can imagine. In particular, if um, the black hole is spinning at 0 0.995, then that corresponds to the epsilon equal to 0 0.1. The log of 0 0.1 is just two. So <laughs> <laughs> now, if you put all pieces together, then the observed flux is given by this form. One thing I want to st uh, stress here is that, you know, we have, the astrophysicists have built a lot of very complicated models where they take all kinds of um, phenomena into account. And we have, in particular, the Norrie clock tone model, which is very famous, a lot of people use. But the thing is, um, regardless of which model it is, as long as it, ha is, it has a good neck limit, then for the net portion of it, at least it should show this kind of behavior. So, for this part, in summary, we have taken a high spin black hole with a thin stationary axisymmetric equatorial disk of slowly accreting <laughs> muscle. But this is generally the assumptions a lot of people use. In reality, I have to say, some of the accretion disks are not thin. It's complicated. We're doing the simplest case here. And we found an analytical universal result for the observed flux for emissions originating from the portion of this that's within neck. And finally, we built a model which obeys the dilation symmetry that's present in neck. Uh, any questions regarding this point? Can you explain the shape of the line? Yeah. So the parts of the shape. Right. So, okay, here. So one thing that's, I guess, truly stunning here is blue shift really dominant. In fact, uh, when the <coughs> is above a certain value, so the closer we are to the event, uh, to the uh, equatorial plane, the more blue shift we see. And this actually makes sense if you compare with that graph here, because the black hole is spinning this way, and all the light you're observing is coming from this side of the black hole, so it just totally gives you blue shift. That's why blue shift blows out. But also, I don't want to claim more than what we've, we've done. There, it's true that we have not done like wave optics, so there are phenomena uh, call it caustics, etc. that um, we have not taken into account because we're doing geometric optics. And that doesn't allow us to resolve certain cases. You have to do it. We didn't do it. Okay. So... But do you have a formula for... Uh, formula for... That you can compare to... I think Avi was asking... Oh, to compare with the data? With the yeah. with <laughs> current no, data. Really. So, I mean, that would be wonderful because <laughs> people use very complicated fluctuations. And Right. That's true, but I mean, I do want to be honest and tell you that we can only deal with the portion of accretion disk that's within that. Yeah, but it might dominate but because of the blue shift. That's, that's true, yeah, there is a chance, there is a chance. Uh, we do see 
some blue shirts here. So this is no red shirt, no blue shirt, and there's some blue shirts here. So, so, so where is the formula that we? It would be nice to apply your formula to this. Oh right, it, well it, it's 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 going to be here. Good. But it, it it has the right shape. Mm -hmm. that the blue shape. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So the lower value here is one over square root of three, and the higher value here is square root of three. These are these terms we all come out. And I, this, uh, I mean, it does not exactly compare with that data plot, I have to be honest, because um, this is, you know, emission just from neck, but accretion just can go for light hours, big. And I think most of the emissions um, actual teles telescopes observe could be due to outer regions of the highest. Okay, the highest frequencies may be described by the neck and perhaps the oscillation because that's the highest blue shape. So it yeah, might well describe the asymptotic behavior of its line shape. So you, you might want to compare it. Right. However, the peak value for the astrophysical plus is it's really peaked at around one. Right. Yeah. yeah. So there is a limitation, but still we hope that there might be some hope. I mean, uh, to quote Andy, I think Andy said at some point that you know there's um, there could be some fixed point. So like, even if the geometry is perturbed a bit, it's not exactly symmetric, then, but things still fall to the, you know, um, <laughs> symmetric case. You're way too fancy to say it. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not over, it's yeah. not overestimating the ability of uh, astrophysicists. I mean, you, you might be doing better. Right? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't plan to say bad things about my research. <laughs> 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 hard because yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of the problem is background. Uh -huh. right? That's true. And getting, yeah. and getting, yeah, exactly. and getting a better the problem is background is not the right. it's not the observational horizons, but I don't think there's it could convert to our formula. Right. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's true. Yeah. Formula. Our formula is right. So if you, that's right. So if you, <laughs> no, it is. It's yeah, true. our formula but is correct for the next thing. If you succeed in <laughs> extracting all the background, it got all great. Sure, yeah. And in fact, this is already a little bit kind of, um, I'm not an expert of this, but astrophysicists told me that, you know, there's soft axis on this side and there's like constant hum on the other side. Real data is very messy, but as Andy said, you know, cats only all the noise and background things aside, there's a hope to see that can be just, yes. And our formula is correct, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Okay, so, now, I'm going to present to you uh, our method to compute the polarization worlds from M87. You'll see why I use the word row. And M87 is a black hole that's 50 million light years away. It's absolutely amazing. I can't imagine that distance. So, um, it's, and it's 15 degrees off axis. And hopefully, it will be observed by the Event Horizon Telescope. What was it? Uh, yeah, it's they just observed. just reported data in, in two months, but it was already observed. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's, that's a great thing. So, Event Horizon Telescope, you know, um, a lot of people at Harvard are actually working on it. It's a whole collaboration around the world. You know, it's a lot of radio telescopes in different um, different continents, and they're trying to use interferometry to observe black holes. Well, I got the impression we're going to have to wait even more than two months for the polarization. Actually, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they, they, have, they should have it. But I don't know what the point is. I think they're processing it. Yeah. And oh, they, they, they don't want to use hands? No, they don't want to use hands. Do you know anything of it? Sorry? Do you know anything of it? Uh, I know that uh, they have very good data of M87. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you might want to wait and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. that would be exciting. Right. And, well, but as far as I know, they started collecting data in 2006. So it's been a while. Right. Oh, the, most, yeah. the most recent uh, season yeah. was most very successful right. because they had good weather. Sure. So yeah. they are, it's just that it took them too long to process it, but they already did the work. Yeah, maybe you should tell us if there's any insight of the information. <laughs> 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 but she's making a prediction before yes. the... Oh, nice. before yeah, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in the previous part of my talk, we 
we thought it was an accretion disk. But here, not really. We don't worry about what microscopic phenomena is happening right there. We just start with some physical process in the neck, which produces energetic photons. And again, we'll be using the method of geometric optics that I described before with the observer screen. Now, there's a complicated story, but I'll tell a simple story. We're, let's just take the momentum of the photon coming at you to be P. And we can define a polarization vector field, which is F. So with that P and F in mind, you'll have a beam of radiation coming out of the, out of the neck, satisfying a few equations. These are not very complicated. I mean, the first one just tells you that it's a photon, and uh, momentum of photon and polarization are orthogonal to each other. Then the polarization is normalized to Y in general. And finally, there's parallel transport. Of course, the photon is parallel transported, uh, but also the polarization vector is parallel transported with it. And we'll also take our polarization vector field to satisfy the neck, um, conserv neck symmetries, as I mentioned before, the curly vectors H0, W0, and H plus minus. So one very important ingredient that comes into our computation is what's called the Peron's local constant. So this is a constant that it's specifically for null geodesics, it's not for massive. And it's constructed from the P and F that I described to you before, as well as L, N, M, N bar, which are the tetras. And the site here is constructed from the contraction between mild tensor and the tetras. So with these ingredients in mind, there is a theorem which says that as long as P is a finely parameterized geodesic, and F is parallel propagated along the orthogonal to it, then kappa has to be conserved. So with that, we can write down our observed polarization as a function of the kappa 1 and kappa 2 we have before. And now, finally, if you apply all the, um, if you apply all our uh, symmetric uh, choices of source polarization, then it will give you uh, the polarization that you can observe on the observer screen in this form. The phi component is related to the alpha component on the screen, and the theta is the um, theta component on the screen. And I'll be plotting it for three cases. The face-on case, where the observer is standing on the axis and looking down at the black hole. The edge-on case, where the observer is standing on the equatorial plane. And finally, the M87 case, which is 15 degrees off, so it should be a little more similar to the face-on case. Okay, so here's one world, here are two worlds. And we can focus on the left picture first here. Uh, so the red circle here indicates the location of the apparent horizon. So that's if there's no gravity of gravity driven curve light, that's where you see the black hole. And now if you think of the top, the middle one point as the North Pole, the first ring L is actually the South Pole, and the North Pole again, South Pole again, just goes on forever. So it's pretty fascinating because, I mean, if we look at well, orange, we can only see one side of it. But because of very different effects, <laughs> we can just see lights coming from here and there everywhere. And it goes around <laughs> many times. Um, but regarding the colors, uh, green is light that come directly at you, they don't go through any little turning point. Yellow goes through once, and blue goes through twice, and so on, goes on forever. So because I'm standing on the axis here, you'll see this exact axis symmetry, which is what we would expect. Whereas on the right here, we have two worlds, and that makes sense because I'm standing on the equatorial plane, and you will expect um, reflection symmetry, right? So the color codes are, as I described before, and also, you, if you might remember this um, red line here, that is the neckline that we can see our accretion disk flux from. So this is a side view. And the black hole, if my thumb is the beta axis, then basically it's going this way. This is the side that's coming to us. So wait a minute. Yeah. So we can see only the red line. So what, we can't see the <laughs> these words. No, so that, that's the tricky bit, right? <laughs> so as I mentioned before, some light we can see everywhere. Some light we can only see at a particular angle. For the Christian disk light, we can only see here, but for other kinds of uh, light with energetic emission of photons, we can't see it everywhere. Yeah. Okay. And finally, this is the case of M87, which is 15 degrees, just 15 degrees of axis. And all the color codes are similar, uh, same as before, and it kind of makes sense. That it, it might seem a little strange that here's green, here's yellow, but it really doesn't, because if you think about when you're 15 degrees off, then all the light coming from here to you, then that's um, no turning point of light coming from here. They go from bigger angle, angle value to smaller to bigger, that's why there's a turning point. Okay, so that's that. And in summary, what we've done is we took a 
physical process in man, which produces energetic photons. We assume that it's invariant under next symmetries. And then we predicted the polarization profile of near horizon emissions from the black hole centering the galaxy M87. The only reason why we're focusing on M87 is because the event horizon telescope has observed it. <laughs> so, but oh, because we're doing theory, of course, and analytical work, it applies to any other high spin black holes at any inclination angles. It can be face on or head on. <laughs> <laughs> Results that you have uh, for yeah. the next mm -hmm. polarization have, have they been computed using numerical methods before at all? Uh, no, I think people who do numerics they usually the computer they don't focus on net region they just compute for all of it. And there's actually some difficulty in modeling because when you don't take into account the special um, like the symmetries and everything in net, uh, it, it's a little different difficult. And their method can actually break down their numerics can break down near the horizon. Usually when numerics break down this an analytical result coming out. But I mean technically, of course, whatever you can do analytically analytically, you can do numerically. Yeah. But because you already know how to do it analytically, no, you I might mean, as well. Why should the rest of numerics break down here? Yeah. Oh, because um so their effects they did not take into account one one special like one reason why guardian coral uh, is originally rolled down um, the next transformations at their coordinates is because there's something funny happening. As we know, like the horizon is a no hypersurface, right? But if you use the uh, boyle lindquist coordinate and you compute the um, you, and you compute the innermost stable circular orbit, it's going to coincide with the no hypersurface. That doesn't make sense because one is no, one is time-like. So it's because of all these complications that Buddy and Hor Horowitz came up with the um, coordinates that resolves neck. That's why when pe people who don't know that they the code they write, they can break down for various reasons near the horizon. So, yeah. so suppose you had not done this work, and right, you yeah. were observing the event horizon with polarization. Yeah. So <laughs> nobody had any prediction on that before? Uh, I'm not aware of any yeah. astrophysics. Uh, there were, I mean, there were predictions, okay. uh, but they for were the based on the Yes, mm -hmm. we, we had a paper with Henry Borkley on any extent. Um, but they, it was based on a code that okay. integrates all these things. You know, as predictors of photons. Okay, but yeah. they're not uh, as nice as zero treatment. So. Yeah, but it might be because, you know, we have more symmetry to deal right. with. So it looks. But the result, your results are under under control. I mean, the issue that she's raising, does that, mm -hmm. does that apply to the work? Uh, yeah, yeah what we, we look at much larger scales than the neck. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can't come, I'm just wondering if you right. can compare. You can't compare. I don't think we went uh, very close. Right, right. I mean, another way of saying it is you could. Near this limit, you get an infinitely long throat. Right. And yeah. your, your computer program would have to generate a grid that would Too long. need to be yeah. infinite in size. And and unless you're clever and use the kind of methods that she has described, you would you you have to do something very different. Uh, yeah. You could numerically yeah. approximate these equations, right. but you really couldn't. You have to go to the dual picture. Right. You have to go together, patch them. Right. <laughs> 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 There's some polarization predictions, uh, and you have to pick a model at the source. People pick many, many different things, and there are some that look like sort of like the world. So, so, so you know, for That's some good. for some choice of magnetic field and source, you know, right. Like each other, different mm -hmm. Right, but as I say, like for our method, we don't consider the microscopic description of how light comes out. We just say it obeys the next symmetry. And the observations so, are going to pick out. You, you could say mm -hmm. by the data on the event horizon, which part is going in your result properly, or how, how do you identify? Yeah, that's that's a tough question. I mean, I, I shouldn't show pessimism again. <laughs> but, but I also well, you should call it pessimism. You should call it maturity. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, well, yeah. Think she's there's... more mature. <laughs> <laughs> Science of Interstellar, there is a book that keeps on about it. Uh, did it did, what did, did you find any problem with it? Uh, actually, you know, the, the, actually the model of equation that's built by the Kip Thorne, it, uh, it had to be corrected. So like, yeah, 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 right. I see. I didn't know that. Yeah, to correct the movie, you know. <laughs> 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 the the, the, the model says that 
is that if, if, if extreme limit, there's no emission from the fusion disk. So it's a zero. And, uh, and Ramesh, that's what he used in the movie? No, no. Ramesh, <laughs> Ramesh and uh, what's his name? Hannah. Oh, uh, yeah, nice. right. Hannah has a good one. Yeah. Actually, uh, the, the interstellar movie ended up using a, a black hole that was not highly spinning. <laughs> so they say it's super highly spinning, but, but the one they show is not. That's right. However, they, they ran simulations at very, very high spin, and they started to see the neckline. So yeah. The, 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 the movie where, where you can start to see the neckline. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. The next time we should draw us that part of the movie. <laughs> 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 in the movies? No, so they didn't use it in the movie, but there's like books with our oh. papers where they published yeah. the various simulations they, they did. And one of them. Yeah, they decided it wasn't pretty enough. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, in conclusion, fast spinning black holes are really not only of theoretical relevance, but observational. And here I'm showing you these three telescopes, which are all X-ray telescopes, called XM, Newton, Newstar, and Suzuku, because they've given us the most amount of data on the fact that black holes are spinning really fast, supermassive ones. And you might wonder, why don't we have pictures? Because Earth's atmosphere blocks X-rays, so they have to be sent to the sky, so who's going to take pictures of them? <laughs> yeah, so now, these are data all from the three telescopes I just gave you. So this is uh, first compiled by Laura Brenneman in 2013, but I asked her recently, unfortunately she doesn't have an updated version, but I did not pick and choose. So this is all the data we knew in 2013 about, fast, uh, about black holes in general, supermassive black holes in general. And a lot of them are spinning really fast. So that's really great news for us. I didn't pick, mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, yeah. if those that are spinning very fast, it means that, mm -hmm. they, that most of their mass, or a significant fraction of their mass, is without the gas accretion. Mm -hmm. Those that are not spinning fast merge in the spin that this, you know. Yeah, this, it's, it's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, the formation of black hole. That's another fascinating topic, yeah. Uh, so that's great for us because the enhanced symmetries in that, they're extremely powerful and allow analytical computations that are traditionally performed only numerically. And what I've done is really a tip of the iceberg. This is an active area of research. Um, there are a lot of papers published. Some people are here, some people are not here. <laughs> so a lot of people are working on this. And now our accretion disk computation is directly relevant to the profile of iron ion emissions from black hole accretion disk. We do hope that we can connect these experiments. And finally, our prediction for the polarization profile of near horizon emission from the black hole incentive of M87 is relevant to an Event Horizon Telescope, which we're getting results on right now. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
do want to mention like the mesh asymptotic expansion method that I showed you. That works for massive particles as well. So yes, mm -hmm. but we thought astronomically, what's of astronomical relevance is the right. Okay, thank you. I guess the committee should. Uh, okay. <laughs>